Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm Matthew Goodwin from Washington University, and I'm joined with Dr. Joe Schwab uh, and Dr. Dan Chuba. And we're going to be talking about uh, a couple of things this morning, but uh, uh, mainly about uh, controversies and uh, current issues in the world of spinal tumors. Uh, you know, I think to get started, one of the things that we've been talking a lot about here at this meeting is um, treatment of chordoma and specifically the role in uh, uh, the role of radiation both pre and post op, but, but more so there's a, a large group of people that, uh, that treat this disease that are waiting post op for radiation and are, you know, if, you, if they have a good resection uh, and, a, and a decent margin, they're, they're following them with imaging. So I think, you know, maybe we can just start and maybe uh, we can start with you, Dr. Schwab, and get your thoughts on um, whether that's the wrong thing. Everyone should be getting radiated uh, or, or where we are with that. One of the problems with, with chordoma, or a lot of things in, in uh, management of, of patients generally, is that it becomes about religion, about what you believe in, but uh, there may not be scientific proof of, of what, what, you're, what you're espousing. In, in our case, um, we, we generally believe in preoperative radiation therapy. We do have retrospective data that supports that. Um, in, in, our, in our series, we looked at patients who've had preoperative radiation, on block surgery, postoperative radi radiation versus patients who had on-block surgery and postoperative radiation in a non-randomized way, retrospectively. And the patients who had preoperative radiation had better local control. Again, there's selection bias and all the problems that you may have with the retrospective study. But based on that, um, that, that really informs how we treat patients. And then over time, there's been some data that, that for us uh, corroborates that viewpoint. For instance, the, the data from Japan looking at skip metastases. And the idea that if you're, if you're treating the, the tumor with radiation and you're also treating the field around the tumor uh, with radiation, theoretically, you're going to be targeting those skip metastases. Um, the problem with waiting, in our view, postoperatively is that if there are, if this entity of skip metastases is real and you've now removed the tumor on block, you've probably left some of those skip metastases uh, where, where they, uh, in the field. But where in the field? The field now has been disrupted. So those skip metastases are anywhere in your, in your field, and I think radiation becomes less effective in that point. But again, this is based on our, our institutional experience without a real control. Yeah, so uh, I can't uh, disagree with anything that Dr. Schwab said, and, and they really do have some of the best experience in this area. You know, what really comes to mind when, I, when I'm thinking about this, obviously no one has the answer, and, and no one has the specific crystal ball, if you will, for predicting it. What we can what we have gleaned from this is if we just dissect the heterogeneity of these patients, the ones that have the simple tumors, the one that's a coccygeal tumor, uh, that's you know S5 and coccyx, is going to do well surgically, radiation, both, neither, uh, and and other ones that are recurrent uh, and they come to you or they're in theory unresectable are going to be challenging no matter what you do, and so. What, what I think it comes down to is there has to be more work done on some of these uh, heterogene heterogeneous ones. And one way we can do that is potentially, as we talked about recently, is helping to genetically characterize them uh, differently preoperatively. Are there patients who are going to recur more commonly? And can we load up on those more and maybe be more conservative than the ones that think are going to be more indolent? And then I'll, obviously with Dr. Schwab's comment about looking at pathology and skip lesions, and as we look at circulating DNA and other factors that can predict recurrence or cure, uh, maybe that will make us a little bit more specific so that maybe the person who has the coccygeal tumor doesn't get pre and post radiation because maybe they don't need it. But maybe the person who says, I think I got most of it in the mobile spine, uh, probably should be more aggressive because it's harder to have those, those margins. So uh, I agree completely with you that we have to be, we have to, uh, support our religion, but go beyond our religion and actually look at the data. Hopefully some of those technologies, circulating DNA and more genetics, will help to, uh, to break these into major groups so that we're not treating everybody with the same recipe and, and make it more individualized. Great answer. We were, we were just talking uh, in the hallway with Dr. Fisher about the same issue and, and when to radiate afterwards. And um, I find it so challenging because in the sacrum, you know, I, you know, kind of where I am, as I was saying, is you know, if, I, if, it's a, if it's a low sacrectomy and I can get a big, nice margin, um, then maybe I'm waiting and imaging. But if I'm in the spine and I'm doing a spondylectomy and I'm peeling it off the dura, uh, even though it's encapsulated, I, I feel less good about that. But I think a lot of the data would say the sacral ones are more problematic, right? They're out in the piriformis. Um, 
And, and so maybe I have it backwards. Maybe I should be doing it the other way. Um, I think you're pretty aggressive with sacrectomies, uh, or at least uh, you know we've talked about this before. Do you always take all of the piriformis? Uh, do, you, do you not take it if it's a low sacrectomy, or, or what's your when you go about uh, deciding your margin here? How are you going about that? Well, I think you know if the piriformis is involved, if the tumor is at the level of the piriformis, uh, so mid sacrum and above, we we tend to look at the imaging very carefully, and we do tend to go if there if there does appear to be stranding or some some evidence of tumor in the piriformis, we we will take the entire piriformis. But I wouldn't say that's routine. It really is a case by case basis. So on that uh, uh, same theme of kind of doing the surgery, doing the resection, you know, the second part of the surgery, as we talked about earlier, is, is reconstructing, right? Um, this comes up a lot. I know I've talked to you uh, offline about this and deciding uh, what I'm going to do moving forward. But, you know, in, in terms of implants, metal, uh, 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 carbon fiber, imaging, looking for recurrence, getting in the way of protons, what, what, what are you guys doing with implants right now in terms of uh, some of these things and, and uh, moving to some of these radiolucent implants that maybe are just as strong or maybe they're not or maybe we don't know yet. Yeah, so I think it brings up a point, and just for people who are not, aren't aware, you know, carbon fiber in the cancer setting, uh, the benefits, the proposed benefits are one, that the imaging is better to follow the tumor because you don't have the artifact from the metal. Uh, and the other one is that for large particle radiation, more costly than, say, photons, so a proton or a carbon ion, that it actually the metal may shield the treatment. And so if you have something that's not as shielding, it may help you with your radiation treatment. And that really is what's been proposed. And there are some data to suggest that that's helpful. Uh, again, there's some religion with the radiation oncologist. Some will say, uh, we need it. We need plastic in there instead of uh, metal. And others will say, we can work around it because we worked around it for years. Um, the third thing that uh, um, I actually find most captivating is, uh, is when I've spoken with the makers of these devices, uh, they have told me, and I, and I at least anecdotally tried it out for myself, is they say that these rods are unbreakable. Uh, and so I took a rod and I tried to break it over my knee and I just hurt my knee. So maybe that's, uh, but it probably would have done that with, carbon, with a titanium or stainless steel as well. I probably hurt myself. But the issue is that they say they don't fracture. And so um, in any construct that we hope to have for a long time, there's going to be strain on that construct unless the, the area is completely fused. And with these tumors with radiation, that can be very challenging. So in the setting of a failure construct, usually rods break if the construct doesn't heal. And then if you somehow find a way for the rods not to break, well, then it fails at the, at the bone screw interface. So, uh, you know, it is interesting to think about the new dynamic. Is this something that, you know, in a classic uh, defense, in a, in a team they say we're a defense that bends but doesn't break, you know, we take a hit. So are these new constructs, do they have some bending in them? Do they have some ability to withstand uh, a specific shear and, and, and uh, you know, fault lines along the metal? That's an interesting thing. I think the, the answer is it's, it's not yet proven out, but I'm willing to try it. For those who have tried or are considering to try it, they are not as modular yet. They're still in that, that infancy compared to metal implants. Uh, it's kind of like the electric car. Soon everyone's gonna have one and we're gonna, we're gonna see it's very, very easy, but there's still just a few companies. So you have to get used to it. Maybe the, you can't bend the rods. The rods have to be pre-made. So there's gonna be some trade-offs as there always is. And hopefully the trade-off is two steps forward, one step back rather than the opposite. But I think we're all willing to try those because of, of that. One last thing I'll say about it is, is that those, I talked about rods and screws, and the other thought would be vertebral body uh, devices. So if you're going to replace a large defect, you're going to have to do something else because plastic actually, uh, bone growth is almost, you know, is in essence repelled from plastic. And so these are not gonna, the bone is not going to grab onto these plastic uh, devices, so you're going to have to have some adjunct, whether it be a, an autograft or, a, or, an, uh, or an allograft, at least uh, to be able to, to heal bone. Yeah, that's been our experience. And uh, the, the re we've really moved towards uh, purely vascularized reconstructions for anterior column reconstruction. Uh, either at first it was just vascularized fibular grafts. Now we intussuscept the vascularized fibula inside an allograft. And we did that because we, had a, we felt we had a high rate of nonunion. Um, but it also has the added benefit of, of not causing the issues with post-operative imaging that, say, a metal cage does. So we, we exclusively use vascularized reconstructions, vascularized rib, vascularized fibula, within an allograft, typically. Both of you have been doing this for a little while and have other things going on, obviously, with your, your becoming chair. And uh, obviously, you've done a, a whole bunch of new stuff in the last few years. I'm curious to hear from each of you, what do you view as the next big thing in spinal oncology? Or what is the thing we need to address most in the next 
five years, ten years? In my view, and my hope, is that, that we, we are able to move away from uh, ablative surgeries when, when the ablation is going to cause a significant change to quality of life. I'm talking about sacral tumors where you're removing S2, S3, S4. It would be great, and, and my hope is that we're going to be able to have some sort of a systemic adjuvant that helps us be a little less aggressive in that setting. Yeah, I think I would just add to that that the, um, in the new role I'm in where I'm overseeing a larger system, you know, variability is, 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 is not great, right? And variability is great in life. Variation is the, is the spice of life, as we all say. So I don't mean to say that, but I mean to say that we can't do one thing one day, try the next thing the next day. Oh, we made a mistake. We actually have to start using best practices, whether this be ERAS, whether this be um, um, multi-D groups that consistently meet, whether this means centers of excellence. And uh, this is disruptive, right? Because uh, Every person, every center, including myself, wants to be considered free to do whatever we want, that our license gives us, uh, that our training gives us. But at the end of the day, I'm better at some things and more thoughtful on some things than others. And if I'm going to try something new, I should at least be guardrailed uh, a little bit. And so as we work on ERAS and other things, you know, enhanced recovery protocols, I think we're going to see some decreased variation and really pull off those, those really uh, rare catastrophic failures or, or complications because we, we learn from our own mistakes. We do not only like to learn from our own mistakes, I'd like to learn from other people's mistakes and vice versa so that we have that community sense. It's gonna take some work, it's gonna take some time, but the patient and the payer and the hospitals are, are becoming less tolerant of people winging it uh, because they thought they might try something, especially with these really complicated patients. You, you kind of really have to be part of a bigger team. Such a great comment. Uh, well, listen, thank you both. Uh, sitting down with, with two of the real, uh, I'd say, masters of the area nowadays. I know both of you guys are very busy. I've been hanging out with them here, and they're both being called away in a different session, seemingly constantly. Uh, so thanks for taking the time to do this.